The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello and welcome to this week's Crashing Glass podcast. As usual, I'm your co-host, Holly Hurley, here with Jill Henley. Hi, Jill. Hi, everyone. Hi, Holly. And this week we have a very special treat. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what happened this week in Boston and how to avoid physical injury. And as a very special treat, we have Doctor of Physical Therapy, Cecily DeStefano. Hello, Cecily. Hi, Holly. Hi, Jill. Thanks for having me. Oh, and so of course. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jill. <laughs> No, I just said, so glad you're here. <laughs> I'm Thank excited you. to talk about the Boston Marathon, given that it was just, well, what, six days, seven days ago. So we're excited for your for some um, thoughts and input from you. Yes, I'm very excited. It's a great time for running. It looks like we're going to have a long season this year with the weather already being nice in some areas. So. Yes, and very warm, I think, for Boston. But I guess before we get into specifics and technical details, we want to talk a little bit about Cecily's history. Um, Cecily, you were a National Collegiate Powerlifting Champion, is that correct? It's true. Pull, and, pull that blast from the past out of there. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, it has been many years. You have since had a very successful career in physical therapy. You're a doctor of physical therapist there in Virginia, right, in the Reston area. I am, I am, and currently I'm actually serving as the Virginia Physical Therapy Association Vice President, as well as a delegate from our state um, chapter to the national level, and I also serve um, the American Physical Therapy Association's uh, Section on Women's Health as their Director in Research, so I'm doing a lot in physical therapy right now. I guess. <laughs> So, Cecily, what is as as a doctor of physical therapy? What is your job? What does your job look like, like day to day? What What do you spend most time on doing? Um, most of my my daily work with um, clients, uh, patients, and consumers is currently right now in the clinic. So, um, patients will come in to me under direct access, oftentimes, which means they don't have to go through a physician or other practitioner. They can just come in directly and see me, and they'll come in with a variety of different problems. I kind of specialize in biomechanical dysfunction, so sort of. Um, to give an example of that in the running world, if you say, you know, looking at your running gait, looking at your back and your hips and your knees and your feet and how that all works together, um, I do that in a variety of different ways, not only with athletes but all different populations, um, but that's sort of my sweet spot is, is how the body works together, not just focusing on, say, your knee, which is the primary injury that runners have, but you know, how, how your knee functions with your foot and your hip and, and your back with the rotation of your trunk and your running gait and that, that sort of thing is sort of my sweet spot. So, Oh, that's so great. Can I jump in and Very ask fun. another question? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, I find well, being a runner and being a long, you know, a long time runner, I find the biomechanics of running to be very fascinating. Uh, and so I guess it seems like one of the things that I've always wondered and I've heard different schools of thought, is that your gait as a runner, so I have two questions for you, Sophie. I'm going to throw them both out there. <laughs> Excellent. Go right ahead. Okay. They may even relate. You never know. <laughs> yeah, no, no. This is, um, the first question is, does the does the gait, like, I mean, how much can you change is, is the first thing. Like, you know, you have this natural gait that we're all sort of born with when if you tell a child to go run, you know, once they learn to walk and run, it, how much of that is something that can be uh, tweaked and changed, and how much tweaking can you do? You know, can you make big changes to your gait, or are you kind of stuck with the natural run biomechanics that you're born with? And then the second question goes sort of right in this, in it, is that, and does the gait come from the top down, in other words, like hips and trunk, and then go down and affect what your knees and feet are doing, or does it go from the bottom up? So where your foot strikes and how your foot strikes, does that affect every joint that's going up from there? 
those are both really great questions. Um, and, and something that I'm pretty excited about right now, I've been working or volunteering with a researcher at NIH um, about some of these very things. Um, and if you, if you look at the gate itself, let's address your first question, but again, like I suggested, they may relate and they very much do. The way that I like to think about this is it's kind of personal to some degree they're finding in the research, kind of like some people like pepper and other people like cinnamon, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very personal. Or some people love peanuts and it's a great source of protein and other people go into anaphylactic shock just being in the same room with them. <laughs> it's, it's kind of personal, you know, um, just like pain is personal and where, you know, they have these pain scales where one person has an 8 out of 10 and somebody else with the same injury has a 2 out of 10 with 10 being the worst pain imaginable and you know, zero being no pain at all. So it, it's kind of a personal question with regards to the gait and how much you can change it relating that to what you're asking. Some people have the ability to make really big changes in their gait. So they're born with the genetic makeup and the biomechanics. You know, their parents had flat feet and they have flat feet. And, and some people can use their um, brain function essentially to, to make the connection between their mechanics and say, okay, I realize I have flat feet, but hey, what can I do to change that? I can, I can strengthen my hips, which helps um, change my foot position so that I'm not pronating as much because it's coming from my hips maybe. Or, you know, just even the way that you send the messages down to how your feet hit the ground, you can make the change. And other people have less ability to make that change. Um, and, and like you pointed out, sometimes their physical structure and their bone structure makes it harder for them to make that change as well. So, so in that sense, it, it is very personal. Um, and then going on to your question, top down or bottom up, they're actually finding it's kind of like a road. You know, it's not a one-way street from, from your brain to your trunk, to your arms, to your hips, to your knees, to your, to your leg. It, it doesn't go just one direction where, you know, it's coming from your hips and it goes down to your foot. It comes back up from your feet and goes back up to your hips. There's, there's two, you know, it's a two-way street, if you okay. will. So it, it can be any, anything can be the driver, if you think of it. And that goes back to your first question: is can you make changes in your gait? Some things predispose us to your feet being the driver based on the way your feet are built, and other things predispose us to our hips being the driver because of the way our hips are built, and other things predispose us to our our ability to make the connection between our hips and our feet, meaning your, um, how coordinated you are or how, you know, coming more from your brain function, your ability to send the message down, to take a step, to take a shorter stride or a longer stride or um, to run more on your toes or less on your toes, you know, so, so it's all connected if, yeah. if, that, if that answers your question. Yeah. So all these people that tell you it's one or the other, they're both right. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. No, that's, wow, that was great. I mean, that was a, a really great, great answers and great info. Holly, I don't, I have, I could ask, I could ask us about 10 more questions, but I'm going to let Holly get in there. Uh, I'm 100% okay if <laughs> you ask me her 10 more questions. But, uh, okay. question. well, please, I just love this stuff. I don't know if you guys can tell, but I, I mean, I love talking about this. I love my job. It's so fulfilling. So I'm just glad to be with you guys and talk about something I love. <laughs> So to that end, Cecily, how hard is it to diagnose where it's coming from and how helpful is that diagnosis actually in helping the patient alleviate some of the pain and or alleviate future injury? Wow, you guys are good at this. What a great question. Um, it's, it's actually a really good question. Physical <laughs> therapy, you're, <laughs> you're fantastic. Um, physical therapists in particular, I think, in, in the realm of diagnosing these kinds of injuries are really positioned well to do that um, because not only do we, do we take in your, symptom, your symptoms, you come to us and you say, oh, I have a symptom, but then being able to take that symptom, take your function, and spend a lot of time evaluating and examining you, doing a lot of tests and measures and asking a lot of questions because um, the subjective piece is important, too, as far as what you're doing with your body and how often you're doing it. I mean, if you're running seven days a week versus three days a week, you know, if you've just transitioned to minimal issue or if you, um, if you've always, you know, if you've had, I had a, a client come in who um, was wearing the same shoes from like the late 80s and you're like, well, maybe we should talk about that. <laughs> you're obviously very committed to your shoes. So, you know, there, there's a lot of factors that go into making that diagnosis and doing a thorough evaluation 
I think is is a really important part. Even before I put my hands on you or have you do anything as a client or a consumer um, of my services, and also just a participant in running another thing. So I think the diagnostic piece is pretty it's pretty key. Um, and you have to do a lot of test and measures, not just in the area where you're having the pain, as I pointed out, but areas above and below that. And subjectively, you know, figuring out what it is that you're doing every day with your body. And then when you make, when you figure out, okay, this is coming from a twist in your hip or the fact that your brain doesn't connect to your hips or the fact that your feet are flat and they are so flat or they strike in such a way that it causes problems up the chain, then how do you move into sort of helping the client make make a transition, make a change? And are there times when, you know, it's just sort of this is the way your body's built and that's how it's going to move? Or, are they, you know, how, how frequent is it that making this diagnosis actually helps you really alleviate some of the patient's problems? Well, pretty frequently, actually. I mean, you know, to be honest, in acute injuries, my outcomes are 100%. Um, I, they just told me. And so acutely, making that diagnosis really quickly, you know, if, if I get somebody in who had an injury on Sunday and I'm seeing them on Monday or Tuesday, being able to diagnose that and quickly make a change in that, it happens pretty quickly. But if somebody who's had pain five years, 10 years, 20 years, it takes longer to change those patterns. So, you know, once you figure out it's the hip, well, that's all fine and good. But if they've had that pattern for a longer time, it's harder to change. And like I pointed out, it, there's so many factors that play into that change that, that those really, they really play into how long it takes to get it better. But, you know, I, I, I'm just, this is really more my personality, but I, I like to, I, I prefer never to say, oh, you just have to live with that, you know, because our lives are so full and filled with so many things. You don't, you don't ever want to just live with that. I mean, there's a reason you're in my office because you don't want to live with that. You know? yeah. That's not the right answer. So anything you can do to, you know, change or alleviate that and people that are runners are so committed and will do anything you ask them to do, which is kind of nice. So you can really make a change once you establish a base, you can really start to make changes because there will, you know, I, my runners go home and they do exactly what I say, exactly the many number of times I say it. Um, sometimes they overdo it, which is, you know, different conversation, but that's one really beneficial thing I think about the running community is that they're just mm. a great group of people and I'll do anything you ask. So. Well, it sounds like you've got, you work with such a great, that great population in that way because it seems that in, in the terms of physical therapy, you know, there's a big range of patients and, and, you know, different populations of patients, right? So you sound like you have a great, um, you got a great gig going. <laughs> Thank you. I enjoy it. It's really, it's really, you know, to make a change in someone's life um, and to see them, you know, finish their first race and be successful or, you know, their goal is to, to come in in the top 10 or the top 20 and they reach their goal and you're able to be a part of that success. You know, I, I just consider myself a part of their journey kind of, and it's, it's yeah. kind of exciting. Um, specifically, you'd asked me a little bit about strategies. I, I, I wasn't sure if I addressed your question, but I was, I was sort of thinking about strategies for preventing injuries as well because I think that keeps people from ending up in my office if we can prevent things. And talking about the Boston Marathon, Holly yeah, had kind of alluded to that. I think preventing them from happening is always my goal. <laughs> so they, you know, because that will really stop your training program. And there's nothing more frustrating when you're on a on track to, to have, you know, a marathon pace. You've got your plan, you're set out, and then you have an injury, and it sets you back. And that can relate to, it also can relate to sort of the people, um, you know, maybe some of our listeners too, who, who are doing more of like training for 5K or training for a five mile where they've got their training plan, but they still get stuck. You know, they're in, an injury that comes up within their training gets, throws them off track. And so I, I guess if you, when you answer, if you could sort of speak to, um, you know, that group as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you know, kind of dovetailing on to sort of, in general, this whole concept of, you know, a lot of the people I see, they're trying to start up the training program and they're going for that five-mile race. You know, here we have the um, Race for the Cure coming up in June and, you know, people are starting to train for that and, and they have these goals and they don't want to get sent back. And it goes into sort of this whole concept of obesity in our country too. I mean, you want to really encourage people to do these shorter runs for their health and wellness and there's nothing more frustrating when you're trying to exercise and your knees hurt or you're trying to exercise and you get injured and then you just feel like, gosh, I'm trying to do the right thing and now I'm hurt even worse than before. And 
that can really be a downer for people. So I think the main thing is, you know, when you're starting up a training program, listen to your body because a lot of people will just say, okay, they get really excited and they're going to go out and they're going to run seven days out of the week and they need to, they stop kind of listening to their, their body who's cueing them, you know, hey, you need to start out slower and incrementally. And it is, you know, depending on our age, we need to slow out, we need to start out even slower um, and, and listen to our body even more if, if we're, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and even into our 80s now these days, you know, we'll have to really listen to our body. And if, if our body tells us to rest, we need to rest. So, and that goes back to that whole concept of everything being really personal. Some people can run seven days when they start up and they don't have any, their bodies don't say anything. And other people, you know, you run five to seven days in a row and your body's really talking to you. So that's a very personal thing, but it's, it's about listening to the machine. And I think one of the research articles that I read was, you know, recently was increasing your weekly running distance by no more than 10%. So don't go gangbusters and just completely increase your running distance by a large amount at one time because that can be unsafe. Right. And, and if you have probably, any, yeah, that's great advice. I mean, I think that's great advice for runners of, uh, you know, any kind of beginning runner. It's the yeah. advice I give just being just for someone, you know, who's run for since I was 12 years old. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. That's my main piece of advice, you know, it's just, not just listen to your body, but, you know, like, that's most important. But to just in, the increase, the incremental, has, you know, you've really got to keep it. I mean, there's a there's a percentage, isn't it, that, that they have that you should only increase by, did you say, is it 10? Yeah, you shouldn't increase um, more than 10% a week. Right. That's the, the latest research basically yeah. shows that. And, and I think, go ahead, what did, what did you say? No, I've heard that 10%, yeah. I think too pushing through the pain. Runners runners are really good about, you know, they know they know what pain is and they they tend to kind of run through it. But you know, there's some a, a lot of times I'll my patients will try to you know they'll try to figure out well what's normal good soreness from starting up running and what's bad soreness. You know what's when is it when is the pain bad? And I think knowing that if pain doesn't subside within a few hours after running, if if like I was talking about the pain scale earlier, if it exceeds three to five out of ten while you're running, if it's sharp, not not sort of that delayed onset muscle soreness, but if it's sharp pain when you're striking the ground, if it's waking you up at night, if it's persistent when you run and you can't get it to stop, or it's in the same area. The other thing is if it's in the same area, every time you run, you get, you know, the same hip pain or the same foot pain or the same pain in your calf, um, that's another sort of red flag. So I think knowing what your red flags are and when to kind of back off and when to push through is helpful. That's true. Leslie, how much of a factor does does outside of just your running, let's say for me, obviously I have a special interest in strength training, uh, play in sort of a preventing injury, strengthening and stabilizing? Oh, that's a great question. And, you know, you know my background, obviously, going back to my college days of, of really having a passion for lifting. And um, now the research is really coming out that cross-training is, is pretty important um, in injury prevention. So making sure that if, for example, that you do have an injury or you're starting back up into running, those are the times when it's really important to cross-train um, versus once you're into a good program, you're you're headed towards a goal, and you're not you're not increasing more than ten percent a week. If you just want to focus on running, that's great for for people who are just runners. But the cross training itself is really important when you're starting up a new program, um, or you have an injury, so that you can keep your cardiovascular up while your tissue is healing from whatever injury you have. Um, and and it can frankly going back to what I said before. Let's take the example of uh, I think. Somebody brought up the pronating or the, or say you have flat feet mm. um, when we were talking about how that played in. A lot of times, for example, that's caused from hip weakness. So some cross-training and strengthening in your hips can prevent you from having, um, you know, foot pain and plantar fasciitis or, you know, uh, tur turf toe, some people would call it, or bunion situations or different other pain stress fractures and, you know, things like that that are related to different pressures being put, put, put on your foot if you strengthen your hips. So I think strengthening can, can really play a part. And now the hip, 
Um, I don't know if you guys are following injury um, or what's happening, but the trendy thing right now, there's a lot of hip injuries coming out. There's a lot of um, a lot of people looking at the hip. And so doing some strengthening things can really ward off um, problems up and down the chain. So I definitely think that's important, and I encourage my patients and clients and, co- and consumers to do that. Cecily, do you, for cross-training, um, would, you know, what do you, I mean, is it kind of getting on, jumping on the elliptical or something at the gym, or is that what is most people seem to do, or, or, or would you say, like, swimming and biking are another, I mean, what is your best, what is your favorite form of, of cross-training to um, prescribe? It's a good, it's a good question. I think it goes back to that personal. I, I like to do pretty, a pretty thorough now to talk to people because it goes back to their personal lifestyle and personal goals too. If you have someone who's their goal in two years is to do a triathlon, then you want to get them on the bike. You want to get them swimming. If you have someone um, who's just getting back into exercise and, and their lifestyle is they work 100 hours a week, they're having trouble getting to the gym. You know, I'm going to try to find something to cross train that's you know, easy for them. If they're more likely to do something at home, then I'll give them some strength training stuff to do at home. If they have an elliptical at work, I'll, I'll try to mix in the elliptical at work with the running. So it really is a very personal thing. And as long as your body, you're moving your body, you know, move your body, um, live your life is yeah. kind of my motto. So. <laughs> That's great. You should make a bumper sticker. <laughs> I should. I'll put it on my list of things to do. Yeah. 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 Well, I know, I know that you 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 have limited time. I just want to throw out for my last question, then I'll let Holly finish with anything she wants to ask. But I have one philosophical question for you, Cecily, because again, I've been a runner for my whole life, basically. And then my and when I was growing up, my parents sort of got into that 1970s running boom, <laughs> like <laughs> the Bill Rogers, Frank Shorter days, where they started running and ended up being marathoners. You know, like recreational, they did a few marathons, so they were doing lots of running for a while, you know, and then for for their, like, kind of in their midlife. So, you know, I've been around running for so long, and my question is, knowing my own body and my own, you know, hip, I have, you know, my hips, I have some dysplasia, stuff like that, so um, knowing my own body and, and of all my friends and family, you know, long-distance running doesn't seem to fit with the human body, you know, compared to many other animals. Let's say, like, evolutionary speaking, were we really made to run long distances or many, many miles a week? It doesn't seem like our joints and our cartilage have the lasting power for that, to do that year after year. Well, I, I'm actually I'm glad you brought that up because it's a question that I get a lot, you know, and, and as a physical therapist, the expectation of the answer I'm going to give is one thing, and people are often surprised with the other. And some of this, again, comes from the latest research coming out, and things that we used to think were true or not, we're now finding aren't as true as we thought. And, for example, runners live longer than non-runners, and they're less likely to develop certain disabilities. Mm -hmm. Runners are more likely to develop, I mean, runners are no more likely, they're they're just as likely to develop osteoarthritis than non-runners. So we used to think, oh, runners develop osteoarthritis more than non-runners, but it's actually not true in the research that's come out. Um, And it's it's even less true if you have proper running form. And I think that's where sort of I come in with, it's, it's about your form a lot of times and your positioning. If you can change your position and, you know, change your position and put your body in the maximum position to do the best work. I mean, there are a lot of, of a lot of people in a lot of countries around the world where people, they're made for running. I mean, they're levers. If you look at it from like a, you know, the engineer standpoint or the architect standpoint, lever systems, their levers are just positioned just right. And then there are people like me that I've done a couple marathons and I actually really like to run. It's fun for me, but I'm not great at it. I, you know, I, I can go in an eight and a half mile pace. But, but you know, I could do a lot easier at a nine-mile pace, and, and these days I'm not running that far. But, you know, so I'm not down there in the six, six, seven-and-a-half-mile range, yeah. but my body is not built for running. Like, I'm, I've like got wider Kenyan, hips like and more narrow. What would you say? Like a Kenyan? <laughs> exactly. My body is not built like a Kenyan. Exactly. And, and you know, we look at that and we say, you know, the, the minimal shoe people in particular love to talk about that, how, you know, some people are really – they run their toes. They don't heel strike. They're made to do that, and they do a great job at that. And then there are other people who are they're biomechanically not built 
the same. You know, we're all built very different. Mm -hmm. While we have some of the same parts, we're, you know, some of the same key parts, we're very different. And I think that goes back to it being kind of a personal experience um, as well that, you know. Oh. Well, did you just mention the heel strike? We, oh, some people naturally have a better strike because they're striking. It's better to strike mid-foot. That seems to be the latest research that the old heel-toe thing is, like, definitely not the best way and that now it's a different strike. Is that is that true in what you know? That's definitely – there is definitely um, a different, you know, shoe stuff coming out and foot stuff coming out where they are saying, hey, we used to think going from heel to toe is the way to go, but now maybe striking midfoot. That, you're definitely right that they're changing that. But I, I hesitate to go one way or the other because we used to say, oh, this is the only way, and now we're saying, no, this is the only way. And, and I would argue that we're evolving in our knowledge about the body. Our bodies are changing, too, in what we used to also, you know, run and catch and kill our food. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and so our... Our functions every day were very different than they are now. I mean, it's like if you look at people like Lance Armstrong who transitioned from the bike to doing some running, how, you know, they were looking at his running gait and saying, oh, my gosh, look how high, high, tight his hip flexors are. And, you know, his running gait's not that great, but, you know, he's still great cardiovascularly or whatever. And it's just, you know, his, his hip flexors have shortened from being on the bike that long, you know, because mm-hmm. if you look at his parents, they weren't necessarily adaptively shortened like his per se. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if he did more running and things... Um, Huh. They wouldn't I be wonder, as tight, you know. I wonder what Lance's PR for the marathon is. Do you know? Do you know that? <laughs> I don't. I don't actually. I don't. <laughs> I'm sure we could look it up, but you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the other thing is, you know, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the um, the stretching. The big thing about stretching. Are you guys? Have you? What do you? Do you have um, uh, thoughts about that? I. I'll tell you, um, the latest research actually is showing that you shouldn't stretch before you run. Going back to the Boston Marathon, everybody thinks, so we've got to stretch and warm up. You know, with it being hot or it being particularly cold, I, I ran a marathon um, in Austin years ago when we had a really bad winter here. I'm in northern Virginia. And so I trained through the winter for the Austin Marathon in the spring. And the weather here was very, the training weather was very different than the weather I had the day of the marathon. And and so this this concept of stretching before you run, we're now learning that warming up before you run and actually stretching later after is, is better. Wow. Um, or so we think right now that's the research. Okay. That makes me so, feel like, a lot less guilty because I never yeah. stretch before I run. <laughs> exactly. You know, I'm here to be guilty living. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Well, that was the, the interesting thing. is, And, and I, you know, I, we look at why this is. I, I treat um, a lot of people who have have had pain for a long time um, on and off and they've been pushing through and, and that kind of stuff and they finally get to me and and I look at them and we're making them change and I think some of that has to do with proprioception. If you if you stretch before you run, your muscles are, are you know, it changes the proprioception or your balance of where you are in space a little bit. So I think the warming up is, is definitely better and headed in the right direction and then stretching afterwards. For example, for, you know, people who cycle a lot and have those or sit in a chair a lot at their desk and have those tight hip flexors and things like that, you know, you definitely want to stretch, stretch, but um, I think doing it before you run is not, not the right time right now so okay well yes, that's good I for, love the for the record Lance Armstrong's marathon was two hours and 46 minutes so he's a lot faster that oh wait yeah really? a lot faster so that's his PR I just looked it up Holly too and I but I found 259 it's two hours and 46 minutes yeah his second uh in New York marathon was faster than his first so his PR was two hours 46 he uh, the first time it was two fifty nine, and then he shaved thirteen minutes off on the second. That's second. amazing. That's, so that's awesome. That's six minutes. That's like six thirty pace, I think. Yeah, or, he, you know, something he's like way that. faster than me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's way faster than most people. But again, you know, when you look at his numbers on his, you know, his cardiovascular numbers are just amazing. Yeah. Like, the guy doesn't have to breathe, and he just goes and goes. Like that. <laughs> amazing. You know, like so that. I think that's that certainly helps. <laughs> So obviously it doesn't matter what his hip position is. It's just pretty regular. Looks very good. Yeah. Yeah. He's not out there long enough to get tired. Uh, I know. Even running that fast, that pace. Well, is that the measurement of that, that your ability, your cardiovascular ability? Is it called the VO2 max? Yeah. Is that one of the measurements? Yeah. So he just has a very, I mean, he just has an amazingly efficient set of, 
cardiovascular system. <laughs> right. He's very efficient. At, or, or so they say it looks like. I mean, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, since we it. are loving having you, but I know that you have to go soon. So what I'd love for you to leave us with, if you're willing, for people who are getting excited about training through this, what looks to be a very hot year, if you could just give us your top five, top five running tips for your running program this summer. Oh, great. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll review a little bit what I've already said. I, did, I didn't warn her about this. This is off the cuff. <laughs> <laughs> off the cuff. Thanks for that because I wasn't prepared. But um, listen to your body. Going back to what I said before, rest if your body tells you you need to rest during your training. Don't increase more than 10% a week. Um, if you already have injured areas going in, there you're going to need to modify appropriately because those injured areas need to heal before you can move ahead. Stretching after you run, not before. Um, how many is that? <laughs> that? That was at least four, wasn't it? Five? Four. Let's I see. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you know what? The other thing is, um, I, I think, um, and I, I'm not a dietitian or a nutritionist, but definitely from looking at how the body functions, you, um, you need to look at your nutrition intake when you're running, you're going to need to, you know, consider what you're putting into your body. You need to make sure your electrolytes, you're, you're loading up on the right fluids and that um, you're eating protein-rich foods and carbohydrates and having a banana for dessert instead of some other things. Yeah. You know, just to paying attention to what you're putting in your machine because um, if you're putting a lot of garbage in your machine, you're going to get garbage out. <laughs> you're not going to get good output um, in your running, so... I think that's, that's five, right? Is that good? Yeah, it is. Yeah, totally five and you know what? I, let me just add a bonus. The, the other thing that, that I've been looking at is the research shows that, you know, having a good attitude about it, too, so enjoying running, you know, instead of making it a chore, well, I have to lose, do this to lose weight, or, you know, I feel like I really need to support this charity, or, oh, my gosh, I have to cram this in because I'm so stressed out. Really enjoying it. So there, there's some research coming out on attitude and how it impacts um, your life. And so I would just say enjoy your running. You know, do it at a pace um, that is right for you. Train for things that you enjoy. Run with people you enjoy being with. Um, and just enjoy your time out running on the trail or on the road or on the treadmill um, and decrease your anxiety doing it. Okay. So that's important to your life. <laughs> so. And that's one of the goals, I, or one of the, I should say, I don't know if it's a goal for everyone, but it's certainly a great um, a great bonus that happens running is that you get that de-stress, that de-stress time or that anxiety that kind of you get to think things through and, and it affects the rest of your life, right? Like it helps to... Helps to keep Absolutely. Balanced. Yeah, especially being endorphins are your own personal, you know, healers. They're, <laughs> they're just great. Yeah, it is therapy. What do you wear because you are an expert on biomechanics? You know, with your feet and legs and running. What do you wear for running sneakers? What are your what's your favorite? <laughs> oh, the pressure! Oh my gosh, I, I, it depends on who's going to be listening to this. What I'm I supposed know. to say here? Um, but I'll start from, from question for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a personal question. I am not um, supporting or for me. You know, I don't get any financial gain from this comment at all. I um I um. I personally, it, it really depends, again, it's such a personal question, like, you know, cinnamon or, or, or pepper or peanuts or, you know, whatever. But I, I, um, I personally use Asics because I, I have a, my feet are more supinated. They're a little bit more rigid. Um, they've always been a little bit more rigid. In fact, my right is a little more rigid than my left if we wanted to be real technical. But my feet feel really good in ASICs. So I've always, you know, since my days in cross country in high school, I've I've run in ASICs and my feet are happy that way. But, you know, I have some patients who have, or clients who have wide feet and have a difficult, they have wide you know, more pronated feet, and they have a difficult time finding shoes that are comfortable for them. And so for those clients, I usually have them try New Balance, and they're usually pretty happy with New Balance. Um, so I, you know, I think I think it's that's a really personal question. You know, like what kind of what kind of underwear and bra do you wear? You know, <laughs> it's kind of personal. You know, so. <laughs> no, but I think you know, I I know that there's the research now with the whole foot strike, but like the heel toe versus the mid 
midfoot, you know, the, the, the idea that people stay barefoot, right? You know, we're going back to the, if anyone remembers Zola Bud, um, which was the 84 Olympics, I think. Um, Anyway, she ran barefoot on the track in the Olympics, and it sounds like people. Some of the research is getting really getting back to that idea that the, the barefoot runner or the or the new running sneakers that are so thin and so much less of that sort of stability midsole stuff that we've all been running in for a long time. There's definitely a push towards that, and I certainly there are patients um, who are well-versed runners who are transitioning to that, that, or even some patients who, who transition to that because they find that other shoes bother their feet or for a variety of re- reasons they may transition to that, or they read, you know, like you, they've been reading about it and give it a shot. Um, I have seen it go both ways where um, it's really good for certain people, and the only caveat I would say there is that when transitioning to the minimalist shoe, don't go from like a really supportive shoe to a minimalist shoe because some what happens is your your muscles have to work differently when you're wearing certain kinds of shoes and then you completely transition to a different kind of shoe. Your muscles have to work differently. And so I've seen some injuries where people weren't ready. They were using a really supportive shoe and then they went straight to minimalist and they thought that their mileage was going to be the same. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact, they ended up with, you know, um, soleus tendonitis, Achilles tendonitis, you know, plantar fasciitis. They ended up with foot and ankle and, and leg issues because of that transition. And so making the transition, you need to scale back and actually train your muscles to transition into that sort of shoe to support you without the shoe, especially if you're running like some of my city slickers run on concrete and want to run around the city, and they go from wearing like a really cushiony, soft shoe um, to nothing, and, and then they end up with these injuries. And so I think transitioning slowly, I mean, some of my people start out with a, a running you know, regime of just running like 100 feet and then they've got the ice and, you know, and then they go 200 and then they get up, you know, slowly to a fourth of a mile, half mile and so on. Um, and then they end up doing great and it works great. And in, in the end, some of them have increased their mileage and, and their pace and have done really well. Um, but like I said, it's, it's just, it could go either way. You ha- it's all about how you do it. You have to be smart and listen to your body and know you know, that when you transition, there's going to be some learning curve on your body usually. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, we're Absolutely. so glad you got to join us this week. It was so nice having you. Yeah, it was super. Thank you guys for having me. I, I was at a conference today uh, with a bunch of other physical therapists, and I was telling them, I gave you a shout-out. I was telling them to check you guys out because um, you're doing great stuff, and I just feel really honored that um, I was worthy to be on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cecily, that was, I'm so psyched we got to talk about a lot of the, you know, a lot of the nitty-gritty stuff about about what you do and, and the, the biomechanics of running. So that was a great topic, and thanks for all your expertise. Very fun. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. So, Holly, I thought, I know we want to, we have some great tech news to talk about. I just wanted to, um, as we move on to that, I wanted to read you the, the, the Lance. I know we both um, feverishly looked up Lance Armstrong's <laughs> marathon PR, and um, I wanted to read you the quote that I found um, when I did, when he had first read, uh, run that New York City, his first New York City marathon, which was 2006. He said that he, this is the one he did in 2.59, just under three hours. And he said that the race was, he said the race was ex- extremely difficult compared to the Tour de France. He said, for the quote unquote, for the level of condition that I have now, that was without a doubt the hardest physical thing I have ever done. I never felt a point where I hit the wall. It was really a, just a gradual progression of fatigue and soreness. So when I think about the tour, the, you know, the Tour de France, I think of it as one of the most difficult athletic endurance events that you could do. I mean, I just, it's, it's just, it, it's always very inspiring and, and, you know, to watch, see them and see the, what they're, the cycling and the miles and the hills, the mountains uh, that they're going up and down in that race. But for him to say that the marathon was extremely difficult compared to that <laughs> makes me just, it's just so, it just find it so interesting because running is, since our show has turned out to be about running, I've always thought I love running and I've done so much running, but running is hard. No joke. (laughs) It is. And it's, but you know, it's one of those things I've always thought about it. And one of the reasons why I've always tried so hard to continue to run 
is because I feel like it's one of the few things you can do in your life without extra equipment. Yeah. Aside maybe from shoes, which as we mentioned, you have to replace frequently. You yeah. you really can run anywhere at any time, you know, under any circumstances and I just I like it for that reason. I think it's it's a flexible sport. It's a sport that doesn't require a hoop and a net and a million other pieces of equipment like skiing. You don't need skis and a big car and a big suit and some goggles. All you need really is a good pair of shoes. Yeah. That's right. I mean, and you can run is, in heels. <laughs> and what? You can run in heels. I just don't recommend it. <laughs> and and the other great thing that I've liked about running, you know, as as a, a kid, you know, what I mean, kid meaning high school kid, and and in college because it did it was such a neat um, fraternity or sorry, whatever, however word you want to use. It was such a neat group and team to be part of um, because it is a tough sport. You know, it's a tough sport in a different way than other sports are. Um, but it's also so efficient in terms of just fitness, everyday fitness, where, you know, when people are wa- like walking or even biking, you, you really need uh, an hour, you need at least an hour, an hour and change to go out and go a walk or a bike and burn the calories that you might want to burn. But you can go out and do that running in, you know, 25, 30, 35 minutes, and you can go for a run and get a workout, give your heart, you know, your cardiovascular system a good workout and it's such an efficient way to keep in shape so that's the other reason I think that's why a lot of people too get get involved in it I think so and I mean we were talking about sports and sports we enjoy and I guess this is a really good time to go into our chick news for the week chick news. And, chick news. and I bet we can talk a little bit about Pat Summit retiring I mean she was a pioneer for women yes she was um I, I what you know, the uh, it would be so great at some point to to have a, a college, you know, some college ballers, basketball players on, and maybe we'll do that in our future show. But Pat Summit really put women's basketball on the map. I mean, she put it on the map, um, and she probably put the University of Tennessee on the map kind of too, because that's you know, it's a, I mean, it, it that women's basketball program became the best the best in the country and um I heard I read today that she Pat Summit has more wins NCAA uh wins a, as a coach than any other any other coach men or you know men or women's basketball coach she's got the most wins absolutely and just to give you some numbers on that she won 1098 games more than any other basketball coach as you mentioned eight national titles and an Olympic gold medal Wow. And she never once had, it says every single player who spent four years at Tennessee on her team graduated with a degree. She was also very realistic with her players about setting other goals outside of basketball. As much as we all wish that we could be in the WNBA, she always made sure that these girls were educated and had options in front of them, which is very impressive considering, I mean, at the University of Tennessee, I think it's unbelievable what she did. she was able to do in her career. Yeah, yeah, no, she, like you said, she is a pioneer. She received the um, Presidential Medal of Freedom this week from pre- from President Obama. You know, I mean, as a women's basketball coach, the money's not, it's, those numbers, the money's not quite, this, you know, being offered to go play professional is not quite as enticing given, like, what the men's coaches have to deal with with their players leaving for the NBA. You know, it's a little, it's it's apples and oranges. Um, in terms of that. However, to have every single one of your players, regardless of where they're headed, to, you know, to graduate with a degree, I mean, that's not easy in any college environment because, you know, when, they're, when, you, when you're at that level of athletic, you know, when you're at that level of Division One competition and the pressure, once you got started winning, can you imagine the pressure building each season to continue, like, you know, keep, keeping keeping it up and making the NCAA, not just making the tournament, but making it to the Final Four, you know, and, and winning? She said eight, eight NCAA championships? Yes, ma'am. Wow. Uh, no, this was great. I loved uh, – it was great to have – to talk with someone with so much expertise about – 
about a lot of, you know, like I said, the, the specifics of running and, uh, cause there's a, I mean, the running boom, I know there was that initial running boom back I mentioned in the seventies, which was a real running boom. That's when really people started being recreational runners, you know, in large numbers. And now I feel like, um, and I don't have research, you know, to back this up. It's more just sort of a life perspective. What I've seen is that there's a, there's a lot, there's another mini running boom that's kind of happening these last you know, whatever, uh, five to ten years where they have the, the couch to 5K programs to get, you know, to address some of the people and, and the weight issues that we're seeing. And they, so there's a, a little, another running boom kind of hitting now. So I think that our show was, uh, and given that the Boston Marathon had just, you know, uh, another running in the Boston Marathon last Monday, it was great timing for this topic. I think so, too. Well, I guess uh, if, if there was a good quote we could end our show on today, Pat Summit has a lot of great quotes, but one of the ones that I really liked, and Jill, you may have one of your own even, but she said, when a team takes ownership, and I think this was a big part of the, the graduating and the things that we talked about, but her quote is, when a team takes ownership, good things happen. Oh, that's nice. Happy retirement at Pat Summit, and Jill and I will take ownership of this week's Crashing Glass podcast. Have a great week, everybody. Bye.